morbidly adherent placenta. It is also known as placenta accreta syndrome. Let us start by defining what it is. It is an abnormal attachment of the placenta to the uterine lining due to absence of the pseudobasalis and the incomplete development of the fibrinoid layer. Normally, as you see in this picture, normally the placenta attached to the uterus through the through the disuda basalis when the disuda basalis is partially or completely absent with incomplete development of the fibrinoid layer the uterus i mean the placenta directly attached to the myometra resulting in what we call it as the placenta creta syndrome so it results from the defective desudalization, typically caused by pre-existing damage to the endometrial myometrial interface. The adherence can be total or focal. When the placenta is totally attached to the myometrium, we call it as the total. When it is the focal, it is when some parts of the placenta cotyledons attached directly to the myometrium, we call it as focal. We do have also another classification of the morbidly adherent placenta, which is commonly used. It is classified based on the depths of trophoblastic growth. So it is classified into three. So the first is placenta accreta. The placenta accreta is when the placental villi attached to the myometrium rather than the disuda, we call it as placenta accreta. As you see in this picture, look, uh, in this picture it is, mm, the disuda basal is absent, so it is attached to the myometry. This is the commonest type of morbidly adherent placenta, it accounts 78 to 80% of the cases. When the placental villi penetrate to the myometrium, we call it as placenta encreta. It is the second commonest type, it accounts 50 to 70 percent of the cases. And there's a third, which is relatively rare, when the placental villi penetrates through the myometrium to the serosa and the, or even to the adjacent organ, we call it as percreta. It is relatively rare, 5 to 7 percent of the cases. So these three varieties were collectively known as morbidly adherent placenta. So the incidence of morbidly adherent placenta were growing remarkably because of the increased prevalence of caesarean deliveries. The incidence ranged from 1 in 500 to 1 in 700 deliveries. It is the leading cause of emergency peripartum hysterectomy. The maternal mortality rate approaches to 10% even in a best setup. The two most significant risk factors for morbidly adherent placenta are placenta previa and prior uterine scar, mainly prior caesarean deliveries. The risk of placenta accreta syndrome in a woman having placenta previa in an scarred uterus is 3%. But the risk is progressively increased with increasing number of caesarean section. But when these two factors are combined, placenta previa and in the presence of prior caesarean section, the risk is significantly higher. So that when we scan such types of women, we need to, be, we need to rule out the presence of morbidly adherent placenta. So as you see in this figure, in the incidence of Accreta syndrome with no placenta previa, the number of caesarean scar increased, it increased significantly, especially when the number of caesarean scar were above five, five and above, it reached to five percent, okay, it's significantly increased. But when these two factors are combined in the second figure, the incidence of accreta with previa with as the number of caesarean section scar increased. It was no scar, the error scar, it is around 3%, with one scar, placenta previa, it's around 11%, two scar, it reaches to 40%, three scar, 61%, four and above, near to 67%.
So the other risk factors are increasing parity greater than 3, increasing maternal age, some mucus, uterine fibroids, previous history of adherent placenta. The risk of recurrence is 20%. The, the presence of the, the having a female fetus increased the risk of morbidly adherent placenta in contrary to that of the placenta previa. As you remember, the male fetus will increase the risk of placenta previa. The clinical manifestations. So, there are different scenarios in this case. So, vaginal bleeding, a woman may present with vaginal bleeding, especially if there is a coexistent placenta previa, may not be identified until in the third stage of labor, especially in the previous era where the ultrasound were not right and the left available. Most placenta creta syndrome were diagnosed in the third stage of labor because of difficulty of delivering the placenta. In that case, the mortality is significantly high. The other scenario is incidentally diagnosed by ultrasound examination during antenatal care. So if there is if the woman had placenta per creta, hematuria may occur because of the bladder invasion. So perinatal diagnosis improved the maternal outcome. Studies found that if this morbidly adherent placenta were diagnosed during perinatal period, the maternal mortalities and the morbidities were significantly improved. The risk of blood loss, the use of uh, blood product and uh, maternal admission to the ICU and injury to the adjacent organ were significantly decreased if the delivery were electively compared with the emergency one. So how can we make the diagnosis of this morbidly adherent placenta? So ultrasound is the mainstay of the diagnosis. The overall sensitivity and the specificity is big good, as you see, 90 and 97% respectively, in a good uh, uh, experienced radiologist. So there are different ultrasound features that tell us about the presence of morbidly adherent placenta. One is loss of the normal hypoechoic boundary between the placenta and the bladder. This is relatively low sensitivity in the specific design. The other is the presence of placental lacunae. Placental lacunae means a dark area within the placenta. So it is a best sign, as you see the sensitivity is almost 100% after 15 weeks of gestation and the specificity is also better. So lacunae is graded into Grade 0, grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. When we say grade 0, if there is no lacunae, we say grade 0. Grade 1 is if there is 1 to 3 lacunae, and they are generally small. Grade 2 is 4 to 6 larger, more irregular lacunae, we call it as grade 2. Grade 3 is many throughout the placenta and appearing large and bizarre one, okay? So this one is a better uh, sign, I mean, it is a best sign. The other is hypervascularity of the uterine bladder interface. This the report the report sensitivity is 84 to 100%. The other is the myometrial thickness, less than one millimeter or loss of visualization of the myometrium. These are also it is, it is variable sensitivity, 21 to 90%. As you see in this picture, it becomes highly vascular. MRI is other diagnostic modalities. It is particularly helpful when ultrasound finding is equivocal or when we do have a concern of per creta in order to assess invasion to the adjacent structures. We, have, we need to have MRI and also MRI is very helpful to assess placenta creta in a posterior uterine wall as well as in the fundus. These are said to be unusual locations. So it is better diagnostic sensitivity and the specificity as you see in the figure. The other is the pathologic studies. The, the diagnosis is confirmed by the pathologic examination of hysterectomy specimen. So, but sometimes the curative sample can be sent for histology. So in that case, the placenta alone doesn't help us to make the diagnosis. Rather than we need the myometrial sample with the placenta. So we can find the placental villi adhered to the myometrium on histology. So when we curate, we need to have extensive curative to make the diagnosis. This is the placenta creta index. This tool is commonly used to assess the risk of invasion of the placenta. It has 
there's five components these five components were commonly assessed as you see the number of cesarean scars and the grade of lacunae myometrial thickness and the, the anterior placenta previa and the bridging vessels can be used so the total score is nine as you see in the figure if it is greater than eight the risk of placental invasion is around 96 percent so let us see the management there is no randomized control trials that examine the management of a woman having morbidly adherent placenta. Since the case is ro uh, low in incidence, there is no level one evidence for to recommend the best management. So the evidence are coming from the case series, case report, as well as the expert opinion. So management is essentially the same for all variety of the morbidly adherent placentas. But for placenta accreta, it is relatively different because of the invasion to the adjacent structures. Relatively different. Otherwise, the general principles of the management are the same. So we'll start from the prenatal care. During prenatal care, counseling is very important. All patients with suspected placenta accreta syndrome should be counseled about the diagnosis and the, the potential sequelae. The woman should be told about these things, okay? like high risk of blood loss, the need for blood transfusion, the need for perpartum hysterectomy, the risk of injury to the adjacent structure. All these things, the woman should be informed about these things. When there is a placenta previa and accreta were coming together, the, the general principles of the management during perinatal care follows those women with isolated placenta previa. So bed rest or hospitalization in the third trimester of pregnancy is very important, especially for those women who are far from the hospital and those having concomitant placenta previa. Antenatal corticosteroids is very important. Serial sonographic assessment to assess the migration of the placenta is not recommended because it is unlikely to migrate, even in the presence of placenta previa. But later, later in gestation, we need to assess the invasion in the varieties okay so we need to give iron to maximize pre-delivery hemoglobin preparations for delivery the goal of this preparation is to provide information for the woman and to plan intervention that reduce complications so that is very important okay multidisciplinary team approach is very important for better outcomes involving the maternal fetal medicine specialists, neonatologists, uh, <clears throat> anesthesiologists, and uh, the surgeons. The vascular surgeon can be needed, the urologist can be needed, okay, depending. So, multidisciplinary team approach improved outcome. So, planned delivery is associated with the better maternal outcomes than emergency delivery, as we discussed above. So, the, the delivery should be planned at between 34 to 36 weeks of gestations. So this is the recommendation from Mater Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. So it should be, the delivery should be planned in a tertiary se care setup because of the need for maternal ICU as well as neonatal ICU care. So it should be in a tertiary care setup. Adequate blood product should be prepared. A small retrospective studies found that 95% of a woman with morbidly adherent placenta requires blood transfusions. And an estimated blood loss in these small studies found that 2.5 to 7.8 liters. So let us see the surgical principles. The surgical principles, the def definitive decisions regarding the conservative management or cesarean hysterectomy should be made preoperatively. So the woman should be counseled about the cesarean hysterectomy, whether the conservative management is going to be planned. Most experts recommend that caesarean hysterectomy with the placenta left in situ. So during this time, the uterus should be incised above the placental attachment site, most commonly fundal vertical incisions. After delivery of the baby, the placenta should be left in situ. After clamping the cord, then the uterine incision should be closed rapidly. Then total and or subtotal hysterectomy should be performed based on the circumstance. So conservative management, who are the candidates 
This is a rarely practiced one. It is not recommended by most experts, but we can consider conservative management in a selected cases whose blood loss is minimal, strong desire for future fertility. If it is only focal adherence, posterior or fundal placenta creta, I mean, in this, in this scenario, we can consider conservative management. Rigorous surveillance is very mandatory. The woman should be compliant. Uterine conservation techniques typically include leaving the placenta in situ with subsequent expectant management. It can be progressive serum beta, CG follow-up, administration of methotrexate, and others. Placental myometrial in block excisions and repair. Histri I mean, hysteroscopic resection of retained adherent placenta are some of the conservatives. These are the adjuvant given in, 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 in combination with the above conservative technique. Uterine artery embolization. Uh, like arterial ligation, administration of methotrexate, delayed hysterectomy. Each of these techniques has a reported success rate of 78 to 80% from the small studies. So the potential complications with this conservative management includes there may be high risk of delayed hemorrhage, infections like sepsis, peritonitis, delayed hysterectomy in 50% of the cases, hysterectomy may be mandatory, Uterine necrosis were reported, Asherman syndrome oh, were also reported in 8% of the cases. The, the subsequent pregnancies, there was a report that the woman had successful pregnancies after having this conservative management, but the risk of recurrence as has been reported, it reached up to 20% risk of recurrence. Thank you for watching.